Hey, Dr. Baker, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Great. Uh, let's just start off. Well, actually, I should say in the beginning that you were actually, I was late to the social media scene, mostly because I'm anti-social media. I still am. But uh, you were the first person, one of the first few people, I don't know how I found you on Twitter. And I think, I don't know if I'm late to the Dr. Baker bandwagon or if um, in, in, the, in the beginning, I obviously have a huge following. Uh, I even followed your, I had, the push notification was only set for you, believe it or not. I had to, I had to turn it off though, because I think I'd be dreaming of ribeyes uh, eventually. So <laughs> my wife, my wife had my phone one day. She's like, who is this S Baker, these pop-ups I'm seeing every five seconds in your phone. I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. So anyways, I turned that off. If I, I encourage everybody actually to follow you because uh, you put out a lot of great uh, information just in general. Uh, but with that being said, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving a brief intro of, of yourself uh, and also how you kind of fell into uh, the carnivorous style of dieting. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a 50-year-old orthopedic surgeon. You know, basically I've competed as an athlete my whole life and that's been a pretty big part of who I am. And, you know, basically the diet just came about as my own health started to, uh, you know, deteriorate a little bit as I got into my early and mid-40s and, and I just started experimenting on what it takes to, to get healthy. And, you know, I kind of went through a whole bunch of different diet iterations, you know, going from low fat, you know, high carb, low calorie to paleo to, you know, low carb to ketogenic diet. And, and currently, you know, I'm doing this, this carnivorous thing, which I've been doing for the last, uh, going on about nine months now. And, you know, quite, a, you know, and, it, and it's, you know, I don't really have a real, care what I eat. I'm not really dogmatic about it. I'm just trying to do what works best for me. And that's kind of what I've seen. And I'm, you know, I just, just, just out of pure curiosity, I, I've just kind of seen a lot of other people doing the same thing. And so now we are actually, uh, because results have been fairly, fairly remarkable. And I'm pretty, I think I try to be pretty objective about it, but the results have been you know, pretty, pretty interesting to me. And so I want to know why. And so we, we've actually launched a study where we're studying people on this particular diet, we're gonna just just gonna see, and we may find that it's, it's that it's just a bunch of smoke and mirrors, and there's nothing to it, or there might be something there. I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep skeptical and keep my eyes open, but I think it at least at this point deserves, uh, you know, further further study, and not just uh, dismiss it as as craziness, which a lot of people do. Great. Uh, I think uh, I'll definitely touch on your study um, in, in the interview, probably towards the end. But sure. what do you think about? Just the the rise in the I shouldn't say the rise because it's always been there, but I think it now it's in the last ten years this rise in the in this modern vegan movement that we're in the midst of. When when your ethical belief is that you know animals should not die or we shouldn't eat them, then that becomes it becomes an easy target for it. And I think we have a lot of people that that have sort of you know devoted their careers into promoting that, and the science really doesn't support it. Although they you know they you can make science say whatever you want to in all honesty I mean it just depends on how it's how it's structured and the questions you're asking and I don't think we've been asking the right questions lately over the last you know several decades since nutritional research has started and so but yeah I mean it's it's you know the problem is you get it's such a feel-good movement you know you're saving the planet you're saving animals you know it's 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 adopted by a lot of younger people that Unfortunately, they pick it up in their, you know, their late teens and early 20s, and they do that for a few years, and they're very, very sort of uh, almost militant about it, and then, and then a few years go by, and then they get sick, and then they quit, and so, you know, we know about 84% of people that adopt a vegan diet end up dropping it, and the number one reason is for health reasons, and I think it's, uh, you know, we have to feed a huge population, and it's hard to do, and, you know, the easy way to do it is just put out a bunch of cheap grains and soybeans and wheat and corn, and that's what we've been doing, and I think we've reaped the benefits of that. Uh, well, I, I'm not going to call them benefits. We've reaped what we've sown with, with the basic, basically the uh, you know the healthcare disaster we have, and it's, you know, we're importing obesity now, and, and you know, and again, it's, it's uh, people want to blame meat, but it's, it's, it's so confounded, and so until you isolate those, those variables, you, you really can't do that. I, I I could beat this position uh, to death, but I mean, in summary, let, let's if there was something where a vegan came up to you, because this is kind of the argument they say all the time. Well, you know that we are you know meant to eat you know either starch or more plant foods versus animal products in some way. But I mean, to me, the the proof is in our intestines, our gut compared to um, you know our 
closest ape ancestors, but if there was something you could say, you know, is a is the proof, so to speak, that we're more carnivorous than we are plant based, is there something you could touch on or point to in that regard? Well, I think there are, you know, there are, there are a number. Again, no no one can prove anything because it's just impossible to do. But I mean, you you can look back into evolutionary. Uh, science and you can look at the fact that I mean we have clearly been eating meat at least for three million years I mean there's there's historical fossil records of hunting tools and cut marks on bones from you know this is even before homo sapiens evolved but this is with back with possibly australopithecus and and the homo habilis and homo ergaster and homo erectus all those pre-humans were doing this and probably even before that we know that even wild chimpanzees you know, which are which we branched off from about. Well, I mean, we had a common answers with them about six to eight million years ago. But even those guys were eat, still eat meat. You know, you can do radiocarbon dating on chimpanzees today, and it'll show that they eat a, a reasonably high amount of meat. And it's you know, whether it's insects or other little small mammals or even other other monkeys, they'll they'll do it. So we we know we've been doing it forever. So we're and we're well equipped to do that. I mean, our intestines are set up to handle it. Very well. I mean, we have an extremely low uh, gastric acids pH, which is about one to one point five, which is on par with most most carnivores and even scavenger animals that, that are. And, and one of the reasons we think that happened is because probably before we learned to hunt, probably in this five to four million year ago range, we were probably started started scavenging off animals, and because we had to have a, a high pH to to eat that stuff, because a lot of it was was you know laying around. While it was contaminated with bacteria, so our high levels of gastric acid uh, are, are designed for that, and we still retain that capacity. Additionally, you know, when you when you eat meat, it is almost, you know, not quite one hundred percent absorbed, but very close to that. Much much better than than fibrous vegetables and things like that. Those things they just sit in our intestines, and then we we can't digest them. It's only because we have a few. We have some bacteria that are allowed uh, that, 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 that ferment those things that we, we have that capacity, but we're not designed to do it. We, we've developed a symbiotic relationship with some bac- bacteria to do that, and it doesn't work well for everybody. That's why a lot of people get a lot of GI problems when they when they have a high fiber diet. And so, um, you know, it's <clears throat> the, the biggest test. I think the biggest answer is just do it. You know, if you do it, you can see how you feel. You know, it's 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 one of those things when people go on these meat only diets it is very remarkable that the vast vast majority of them say they feel better and so to me you can make any historical argument you want you can make any biochemical argument you want uh you can make any sort of anatomical argument you want you know a meat eater doesn't have to have sharp fangs and pointy claws i mean there are lots of fish that do that are that are meat eaters i mean they're car- the blue whales are carnivores i mean they, they just continuously suck in you know you know, sea life, you know, and so it's not, it's not necessarily the way you look. I mean, we evolved over millions of years, the capacity to hunt. We evolved the capacity to speech. That's why we don't have big fangs and pointy teeth. That That's not conducive to speech. And so because we, we've changed a little bit of our anatomy, but our intestinal tract is, like you said, it's very closely aligned. Probably the closest animal we're aligned to is a wolf, which are high, highly, highly carnivorous. And if you can look at radio isotope data, specifically radio nitrogen data from, you know, 50 to 100,000 years ago, it shows that we were top level carnivores. We ate more meat than, than even the wolves did. And so if you think about what's going on in the world that at that time, most of human homo sapien evolution, which, which takes place, we know at least we're 300,000 years old and, and possibly a little bit older, but all that time, the vast majority of it was spent in ice ages. We were in big glacial periods, and so it doesn't mean we we're all living on ice, but most of the land was probably converted to grasslands, and it wasn't all tropical fruit where, where some of the African ancestors might have, might have derived from. But So you spent all this time on grasslands, and your food is basically the animals that you follow, and that's what we did. We followed all these animals across the globe and hunted them and ate them to to extinction. I mean, every giant megafauna animal that was in existence, except for a few, has been gone. And we there's pretty good evidence that we wiped those all out. And so probably there was a time when there were very few humans on the planet, when we know that, and a whole bunch of animals to eat. 
and, and we just ate them. And that's what happened. And probably, you know, there were times when some people ate a few plants, some people ate, you know, the, the, things here and there, but that wasn't their subsistence. They, they knew what their food was. And if you're moving from one part of the world to another following animals, you know, you don't know what plants are safe to eat or not till you, till you've tested them out. And, and, and so you had to survive on animals. And so I think we're, we're well suited to do that. Yeah, there's so many questions I had in there that uh, great, great points, everything all together. Uh, what would you say to somebody that, uh, well, let's just say myself, for example, I mean, there's no question that I, whenever I, the more fiber I put in my diet, the worse I felt. I mean, when I tried the healthiest diet, which I thought was like salads and nuts and berries and stuff, I, my GI system just felt horrible. Uh, and that got progressively worse over time. And meat is one of those things that to me always just agrees with me no matter what. Um, but my fear would be, let's say I adopted a carnivorous diet. Is that something you kind of would have to be, um, I guess this is touching on sustainability of just the diet that, you know, let's say I stay with it for a period of time. Does that mean I can, I would assume if I stuck with it, my ability to digest and handle certain carbohydrates would be diminished. So if I wanted to have a pizza one time, once in a while, that would kind of not feel too good. I mean, um, is there an issue with somebody going, I mean, if you're kind of going this way, do you kind of have to stick with it basically? Well, I think certainly, you know, uh, yeah, I agree that is an issue for a lot of people. And I think what happens is, you know, we have a gut microbiome that's responsive to whatever diet we have. And so if you spend, you know, whatever, a month or two months or three months on a carnivorous diet, you know, your gut microbiome is going to change to accommodate that. And, and as is your, your metabolism, as is, you know, different digestive ratios and, you know, your body basically adapts to whatever you're, you're, you're providing for it. Um, and so if you go in and, and, you know, eat something that you haven't eaten in a while, you'll probably have an upset stomach. I mean, I think it's completely, uh, a valid point. And, you know, it's the same thing from, for people that, you know, when they first go on like a vegan diet, I mean, they will, they will, because they're putting all this fiber in there, they'll notice, uh, you know, changes there. So I think that's, that's reasonable. But I think what, one of the things that, that, that people will find is things like joint pain, which is one thing I noticed. You know, as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm pretty sensitive to this stuff. But I noticed that joint pain and muscle pain and tendon pain that I had going into this stuff just went away. And so what my thought is, is there's something else in the diet that's not meat. And I don't know if it's sugar. I don't know if it's omega-6 soils. I don't know if it's you know certain uh, phytochemicals that plants produce as pesticides to to ward off the insects and fungus, uh, you know, attacks. I don't know if those things are how they're affecting me or which ones are. I just know when I don't eat them, you know, my general body function is better. And so I think the best way to sort that out, you know, is is to just eliminate all those things. See how you do, and then if you want to add things back in, you know, say you want to say, hey, I want to I want to go back to eating fruit again. Then you do that, you know, and, and you know you, you might have to adjust for a couple of weeks because your microbiome has to adjust. And then you go back and say, okay, I'm eating fruit, I'm eating meat, and I still feel great. Then that's fine. But, the, but there's a lot of people that doesn't work for you. There's a lot of people that are really insulin sensitive, and so particularly fruit. Unfortunately, you know, we we've sort of sort of changed it towards got a lot more sugar than it used to. And so some of those people just can't can't do that for reasons of metabolic issues. You know, there's other people that, that will handle certain vegetables fine and won't, won't handle handle other ones very well. Or certain people, same thing with wheat, wheat and corn and, you know, different grains. And so you just have to sort of see where you're at. But I, I think one of the things is if, if you never if you never test it, if you never eliminate all that stuff, you never know what is actually causing a problem for you. And so you have people that are on these diets where they're eating, you know, hundred different types of food and then they'll may say, Well I think this is bothering me, I'll eliminate that. But you still have ninety nine other variables in there. And so um but I think what's uh, to get back to your point, I think that yes it can be a problem if you if you switch diets from one to the other. I think it's a temporary problem. And I think you just have to do an overall assessment to see where you stand. But I mean certainly, you know, just from a you know can you be on an all meat diet? I mean, I, I think clearly you can. I mean, I've done it, you know, coming, you know, nine months now without any issue. If, if anything, my health continues to get better and better. I see signs of aging that are reversing. My physical performance continues to get better and better. And, and you know, and the most important thing is I'm not alone. I see, I literally see thousands and thousands of other people that are doing this. And so, a great grant, this is all anecdotal stuff. And it needs to be formally tested. And I'm in the process of trying to make that happen. But, um, you know, it's just interesting from an athletic 
standpoint for me, you know, the, 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 the level of increased performance that I've seen, and I've been training a long time. I mean, I, I've been training my whole adult life, 36 years now, and training at a high level. And, I mean, without, you know, without trying to embellish this stuff, I mean, I've seen a significant jump in my performance, which I've never seen with any other diet. I mean, certainly I don't have any experience with drugs or anything like that. I've always been against those things. But, I mean, the the, the, the performance benefits I've seen uh, with a diet that contains, you know, four to five pounds of meat every day has been pretty tremendous. And so that's extreme. But, but at the same time, it seems to be what, what supports me and allows me to progress. So that leads me to my next area, which is uh, really important to me, and I have very huge curiosity just being a professor of exercise science, and that is the athletic performance aspect that, for me, I honestly was a little bit shocked. And I think you're what makes you so unique and also attractive to, to watch and see what happens is that you are uh, a world-class athlete. I mean, you have uh, world records under, is it indoor rowing? Yeah, I've got, yeah, right now, I mean, that, since I've been zero carb, I, you know, or carnivorous, I've set, you know, I mean, I currently own three, three world records on the Concept 2 rower, and I've, they're all, my, I've broken my own record, I don't know, 10 or 20 times, so I keep breaking them, so I mean, I just keep getting faster and faster, but uh, yeah, so that's what I'm doing right now, currently. So, some questions immediately would be, you know, that's obviously a fairly high intense activity, it's not just like, you know, long, you know, gradual, long, slow distance running. What do you think is going on? I mean, I would just think the, the specifically the glycolytic system, where you're not having any carbohydrates or you know very few. It's not coming from minimal aspects of the meat. Um, where is that? What are those carbohydrates essentially being produced? That more or less from gluconeogenesis being? Is, is there a storage form that's actually occurring, or what do you think is going on that's allowing you to crank out that high output and also still perform and even break records uh, with no carbohydrates? Well, I think you know, and certainly you know, I you know, I, I would have to do muscle biopsy to test it. You know, this is something that's just speculation at this point. I mean, they've done some of the research on the ketogenic athletes, and we see some of this. But you know, clearly, I'm I'm re, re, resupplying my glycogen to some capacity. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that. I am using some amount of glycogen for high level efforts. You know, I use a, the, the 500 meter concept two row for, for instance. I mean, that is an extremely, extremely highly glycolytically demanding effort. You know, it's a, you know, it's a minute. Well, for me, about a minute, 15 minute, 14 second all out everything wow. as hard as you can, uh, you know, time, which is, you know, you really touch into this anaerobic glycolysis, you know, this glycolysis, glycolysis portion. And, you know, for me, I've been I've been fat adapted for three or four years now, so I've, so I've had this long time to adapt to this, and so I am fairly certain that you know I got, you know the gluconeogenesis provides me what I need to some degree. You know, lactate recycling will provide some of that. You know, I probably oxidize fat at a higher level, even at higher efforts of intensity than than than, than a carb based athlete does, and so you know. While I'm still at a very high level of VO2 max, my fat cont- contribution is probably very high still. And so, one of the nice things about this, I think, it is less taxing, you know, with with regards to oxidative stress and creating reactive oxygen species. And so, I think it's easier to recover from. And so, even though I'm training really at a high, hard level with high intensity, I don't think I am beating myself up metabolically like other people do, and so I can recover. Well, I mean, I'm 50 years old, and I'm, I mean, if you follow my Instagram, so I mean, I'm doing this stuff day in and day out, you know, without, I'm not, you know, I'm training hard almost every day, which is what you're not supposed to do when you get older. It's, you know, that's what the young Olympic athletes do, but I'm still doing it at 50, and I'm no worse for the wear. In fact, when I take time off, I, I feel like I'm missing something. Wow. You know, so it's, it's interesting, but I mean, you know, then again, you can look at, you know, just what, what's in, you know, red meat in particular from a for, 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 for from a performance standpoint, I mean, it's full of creatine, which we know has, a, you know, it's been well studied. We know it does have a beneficial effect. You know, it's got carnosine, which is also an athletic enhancer. It's heme iron, which is which is also effective. Obviously, animal protein. I'm getting a ton of animal protein. And so there's probably a, a number of other, you know, things that are in meat that we don't even know that are, that are performance enhancers. You know, if you look back in history, you can look back to the original Greek Olympics. You know, with the, a lot of those athletes knew even back then eating meat was what, provided them strength and endurance uh you know you can look at the the guys that are called beef eaters in, in england they're the royal guards and they knew they, they those guys were called beef eaters because they had an important job of protecting the royalty 
and <laughs> they were given extra rations of beef because they knew it was what kept them going. You can look at the Mongols, you know, the the, 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 the Mongol raiders, you know, those guys, they basically brought their livestock with them and ate that as their food when they battled, and they, and they conquered large parts of the world doing this. And so we've got all these historical examples of people that were performing well, and I think that uh, just from an athletic standpoint, I mean, you know, most people, I mean, you know, if you look at most young guys that have an athletic career, it's, it's, it's a bit of a risk for them, so they, they, they don't want to do that. I mean, I'm doing it now because I have nothing to lose. I mean, who cares? <laughs> but yeah. what I can, you know, I'm not, I'm not, there's no money riding on this for me, but what it does show is what's going on with my physiology. When I, you know, when I just eat a, you know, a diet that's four or five pounds of red meat every single day with nothing else, no vegetables, no sugar, none of that stuff, and I'm able to improve, you know, in a very objective fashion. I mean, that concept of rowing machine is, you know, it's purely about physiology. I mean, it's, it's a very nice tool. I mean, there's very little technique that goes into it. I mean, once you learn it, then it all just becomes about where, is you, where are you at from a physiological standpoint. And all I see is just improvement after improvement after improvement. So it's very interesting. You, you touched on how you kind of, you went from a ketogenic diet to this, and also I'm assuming you had probably, you mentioned a previous history of other diets. Do you, what would you say to maybe to play devil's advocate, and they, they'd use this against even the, you know, high level supposed vegan athletes that are out there too, going the opposite on the spectrum. For someone that says, well, really, maybe it's not just, maybe it's not your diet, you're just a, an athletic specimen that, um, you know, I guess my, my point is how much of that can you judge from your diet? And obviously you're fit and you're obviously a genetic, uh, have some genetics on your side. Um, what would you say to someone playing devil's advocate in that, in that respect? Well, I mean, that's something you can never know. I mean, for sure. But I mean, you know, I can tell you that, you know, I'm getting older. I'm older than I was two or three years ago. And, you know, if you look at pretty much anyone, their, their performance declines after, you know, certainly as you get into your 40s and 50s and 60s. I've trained all with almost an identical training scheme. I haven't ch changed the way I've trained at all. And, you know, I, I've seen, you know, basically changes in performance when we look at, you know, for indoor rowing in particular because I'm very, you know, that's what I'm competing at. But even just other lifts, you know, when I got to train in the gym, things I don't even try to, to strengthen, I, I just find I'm stronger there. So it was, you know, I use my deadlift, for example. I mean, back in January when I started this diet, I could, you know, I could pull 500 pounds for a double with no belt, you know, and that was kind of tough. I tried it, you know, a few months, about four or five months later after being on the diet, I was up to eight reps, and, and this is without really training. Wow. It. So. You know that's that, that that's a decent deadlift at 50 years old. You know, especially when, you know, but 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 to not really train it and to see that little bit of a jump in strength is, you know, I think that's interesting. You know, I, like I said, if I were doing a training cycle for deadlift, like when I used to power lift and, and specifically working on that, then I would, you know, then I would say, okay, well, it's it's probably the training and not the diet. I mean, I've seen things like you know, just you know, I buy, I have a, a sort of a heavy kettlebell and I you know I. I was up to like 25, 30 swings with the thing. You know, I was 176 pounds, and now I'm pushing it to. I'll probably hit it for 50 in the next couple of days. And so I just, I just see these things that I'm not really concentrating on, but they're, they're, they're coming along too. And so, um, you know, and to the point being, you know, I, I, I've tried the other diets. I mean, I honestly had. It wasn't that I said. I'm going to try eating meat and, 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 and forget everything else. I mean, I tried all those different diets out there and cause I, I don't care about what I eat. I care about how I perform. So that's the bottom line for me. And so, you know, if, because I, you know, I, I did these diets and then I would add a little bit of carbohydrate in or I'll add this or that in and, and try these things. And I didn't see any significant performance improvement. And so, I mean, I'm still open to trying other things. I mean, you know, I may, you know, I'd like to get a year under my belt, with this because I, it's, it's a personal interest level and, and, and test some things. But at that point, certainly I may try some other things and see how I do it. If I'm worse, uh, then I'll go, I'll continue to do what I'm doing. But if I'm better, I'll change because there's no, there's no, I don't have a, like I said, I don't have a real interest in this other than my personal health and performance. Wow. I got so many questions, but I, I want to respect your time and let's, let's uh, segue into your, um, your experiment that you're doing that I think will, definitely be selling a lot of other people in this rod if depending on the results um can you touch on your n equals is it n equal one so it's n equals many many okay so okay. And so one of the 
critiques that I've received and other people is, you know, you're just a, you're just an N equals one self experiment. Your data is it's cute, it's 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 interesting, but who cares? And so, you know, for me, I'm so that's fine, and I, I certainly respect that criticism and it's valid. And so. I said, well, what if you get a bunch of people that, that there's, a, there's a big movement for self-experimentation right now. There's lots of people that want to, you know, they, they brain hacking and biohacking and they want to test whatever, exogenous ketones and all that stuff, but, it, but it's never really controlled. And so uh, 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 me and another guy named Matt Mayer, we met, you know, we, we, I talked to him and he's a, he's a bit of a computer guy. And we, we had the same idea. I said, well, let's just kind of set it up so people can all follow the same protocol and, and, and just collect results. And, you know, they're going to do the self-experimentation anyway. Why don't, why don't we set a format for them to do that so they can track their own results? We can, we can monitor things that we all want to monitor in common and then just find the results. And so right now we have, uh, you know, about 300. I looked at the stats. We've got about 340 people that have started entering data on a 90-day carnivore experiment. They're going to spend 90 days eating basically just meat and drinking drinking just water for, for 90 days, and we're going to track a whole bunch of things. Pulse, sleep, you know, for the guys, can they, can they have an erection? Because the vegans will say meat causes impotence, bowel frequency, uh, you know, mood, uh, eth, you know, performance, uh, just for some people, uh, and then allow, there's some lab testing at the end. And so when, when it's all done and said, we'll have some data, I don't know what it's going to turn out. It may show that everybody got worse or, or everybody felt bad, but this is this one is just basically, can we do it? Can we set up the mechanism to do this? And then if, if the answer is yes, which I hope it is, then at that point we can start saying, okay, why don't you take 50 people that are on a standard diet, you know, everybody draws whatever you want your interest in. There's some people that think maybe testosterone is, is, is increased on this diet. I mean, I think there's some clinical evidence that shows that, but we don't know for sure. So we could take 50 people. Everybody starts, everybody gets their testosterone drawn, they all follow the same exact protocol, they all record everything, and then we record it at the end. Now, these are studies that can be done in a university, but the problem is they don't get funded. And, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to do. And, you know, the last time they did a carnivore study was in the 1920s or 1930s. It's been almost 100 years. Wow. Or 90 years since somebody's checked this. And so and it's, it's not like it's hard to do. It's just that, uh, you know, I think people are just don't think it's possible, even though it's clearly, clearly doable. And there's clearly people reporting good results with this. So we'll see how the results turn out. We're going to, we're planning on making it public, you know, keeping the data. In fact, today I'll put an update on the, on the, on the initial demographics and then we'll just kind of update people as they go. So people want, they want to follow along. How are these people doing? What's the first light week like? What's the second week like? How are they transitioning? What kind of issues are they having? And then we'll just follow them, follow the whole group along. It's kind of like a mass group spectator experiment and then if other people want to do stuff like that and it doesn't have to be a carnivore experience it can be anything if you want to say if you want to get 500 people via social media because social media is such a powerful tool now you know that we can get this interconnectedness that we've ever had you've got 500 like-minded people that say hey i don't know do exogenous ketones help or not we don't really know i mean the supplement companies say yeah sure they do the guys at Celery are always going to always going to say yeah but what happens if you test it in an independent fashion and you have you know, uh, 500,000 people that all do it and they all record whatever metric they're interested in and they run it through, everybody runs through the same protocol and, and then we can get some results and then and a lot of it, you, you can save people money because some of, the, some of the stuff out there, you know, we've got people who are selling you stuff that's just, they're, they're just making money from you. Oh, yeah. It doesn't work and I, I have a lot, of, I have a hard time with seeing people getting ripped off and so that can be a tool to, to, to test those things. And to be clear, you don't use any supplements or promote those at all whatsoever. No, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I sort of raise the ire of some people because I think, I think you don't need them. I mean, I think, I think if your diet is poor, then yeah, you can probably, you, they, they may be of some benefit. But I think, man, I think there's, a, it's, it's really hard for me to, to buy into the fact that some people think that you can't perform at a high level without supplementing. And I, I mean, I'm, if anything, I show for myself that I can do that, and so I, I don't take anything. I mean, I mean, I will. I, let me back it up. I have taken caffeine pills once in a while, <laughs> but but other than that, I don't take creatine. You know, I don't, creatine would be silly for me eating all the meat that I do. But yeah. in years past, I did I did some of that stuff. You know, but I don't I don't the, all the pre workouts and post workouts and all the stuff's on the market right now that people think they can't go to the, they can't they can't function without this stuff. I mean, to me, it's just. It's kind of preposterous. I mean, you know, you, you can do 
a lot of things with just food, proper training and proper proper rest. And so I think the other stuff is, I think it, I think it largely supplements are effective in making people money. Largely, yeah, I agree. And I know we didn't touch on it today, but I, there's other podcasts and other uh, I know YouTube videos where you touch on uh, people obviously wondering about. Uh, vitamin C and scurvy, but you actually go into that on another podcast, which I'll link to. So I don't want it, you don't have to go into that now, but I know that's something you've discussed. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, basically the proof's in the pudding. I don't have scurvy, and so yeah. I mean that, that's 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 just a short answer. We, you know, we can go into the science and that at some other time, but uh, you know, I've certainly talked about that. And I, I talk about that constantly, but I mean, I don't have scurvy. <laughs> Thousands <laughs> of other people just don't have scurvy, and so it's it's really not an issue. Is there, um, to, to, to wrap it up, is there a place where, well, is there a website or even something for future, um, you know, the, the N equals many studies that might happen in the future that people can go to or anything else about you that you want to plug? Yeah, so N equals many dot com. You know, right now we're starting with this carnivore study, but we're going we're gonna to be looking at people to add to that. And so if you want to design a protocol, uh, you know, you go into the N equals money dot com forum section, we can talk about it, generate it. We have the capacity using our data tracking tools to modify to pretty much any 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 sort of study you want to do and if it's reasonable you know if it's not crazy like you know like something dangerous but i mean if it's something you can reasonably do we we can develop that and track that in social media you know, and, and advertise that and bring people together to do it so if you if you have a strong belief and you've seen something that's happened for you and you've heard other people come together and test it you can go to that site and, and do that that's going to be something as we Right now, we're doing this proof of concept stuff, and so once we've shown that we can do that and refine the the tools, and then we'll start allowing other people to, to do that. Um, you know, I, obviously Twitter S Baker MD. Uh, my Instagram is what is it? Sean S H A W N Baker B A K E R nineteen sixty seven. Uh, you know, I'm I'm currently up here, you know, working on a book about this stuff, so that'll come out. Yeah, you have to. So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know when, but we'll see how how long it takes. Maybe well, it might be when we get the results of the study because that might be something interesting to include in the book. But anyway, yeah, that's all I've got for now. Great, thank you so much. I'll I'll just say a quick goodbye to you off the air, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. sure.